good to be with you this evening. As you've just heard, I'm with the Aquarium of the Pacific, and we have a strong and growing partnership with Art Center. We are strong believers that art and design are very important in conveying scientific messages and environmental messages to the public in ways that engage, educate, and empower. They are going to be necessary to redefine the relationships of humans to the earth to put us onto a more sus sustainable trajectory. And so to create and influence change, I think those are the domain, the domain of art and design. Reefs, Rubbish, and Reason, it's a beautiful, powerful exhibit. We have too much rubbish, our reefs are in trouble, and the only way we get out of this mess is by reason and creativity. Tonight I want to talk to you briefly about stewardship, particularly about stewardship of the ocean and coral reefs especially. Stewardship means to take care of something that doesn't belong to you. Something that doesn't belong to you. We are all stewards of our environment, particularly the world ocean and the atmosphere. These are the, what are called the two global commons. They don't belong to anyone and they belong to everyone. And we must be better stewards of our environment. We have a moral and ethical responsibility to take care of them. All of us affect the ocean and the atmosphere no matter where we live and the ocean and the atmosphere affect all of us no matter where we live. The world ocean covers 71% of the, better start with this, 71% of the earth and the ocean accounts for 98% of all of the living space on this planet. 98% of all the places that you can live are in the ocean. We truly live on planet ocean. There's a, an ancient myth of the Yurok Indians of California that two great beings, thunder and earthquake, worked together to create the ocean basin and to fill it with water. And after they had completed this, it was so beautiful that animals came in large numbers to live there. The story speaks of seals that came to the newly formed ocean as if they were thrown in by the handfuls. And looking upon the ocean they had made, vast, deep, and full of water and life, earthquake and thunder were satisfied that their job was done. The ocean was large enough to provide sustenance for all of Earth's creatures for all time. But we are changing that. Until fairly recently, we looked upon the ocean as being infinite of being so large and so vast that it was virtually impossible for humans to impact it. And as recently as the 19th century, very famous biologists, including Thomas Huxley, proclaimed the endless, inexhaustible resources of fish in the ocean. Huxley wrote, quote, probably all the great sea fisheries are inexhaustible, close quote. Today we know that two-thirds of all major marine fisheries are fished at or above sustainable levels. We are now acutely aware of the finiteness and the vulnerability of the world ocean and the populations of its living creatures. The challenge for us is to translate that awareness into stewardship action. Throughout history, the ocean has played a major role in the evolution of life on Earth, including our own. Indeed, it is in the ocean where life originated, and it is the ocean that makes life on this Earth that we know, including ours, possible. Approximately half of all the annual global carbon fixation, that is the Earth's photosynthesis, occurs in the ocean. 95% of it is carried out by tiny microscopic plants called phytoplankton tiny floating plants. Photosynthesis in the ocean is restricted to a very thin upper layer where sunlight penetrates. It's less than 1% of the total volume of the world ocean. And virtually everything that lives in the other 99% depends upon what happens in this thin upper sunlit layer. <clears throat> most of the ocean, if you can see in this, most of the ocean is in total darkness all of the time and is within a few degrees of freezing. 
The ocean provides us with what are called ecosystem services. It provides more ecosystem services than all the ecosystems on land. Ecosystem services are the benefits that we receive from healthy, productive ecosystems, and we need them for our survival. The ocean provides more than half of the oxygen in the atmosphere. So in a sense, every other breath you take comes from the ocean. The ocean is the Earth's great thermostat because water has a very high specific heat. It can absorb or release a lot of heat without its temperature changing very much. And it has been instrumental in the evolution of life on Earth. The ocean is a great repository of the Earth's biodiversity. It's a major source of protein for more than one billion people on this planet and for many people who live on, live on island nations the ocean is the only source of protein they have. The ocean mediates the primary driver of climate change, that is CO2 in the atmosphere, and it does it by removing CO2 from the atmosphere. The ocean contains vast stores of biologically active compounds, compounds that can be synthesized into drugs to benefit humans. Most of these are yet to be discovered, and many of them come from coral reefs, and the single group of animals that have the most biologically active compounds are the lowly sponge. You will see some sponges in the beautiful exhibit that's here. The ocean is also a source of inspiration, of recreation, or maybe more appropriately, of recreation. And now we know that human activities are affecting the land, the ocean, and the atmosphere and we have put in jeopardy the Earth's ability to sustain life as we know it, including our own. Within the past six months, scientists have reported that we have lost about 40% of the phytoplankton biomass in the ocean, and we have lost it over the last 50 years. Remember, this is the base of all the food webs. And within the, the, approximately that same period of time, the ocean has become 30% more acidic. So we are really changing the ocean in fundamental ways. And these changes are, have critically important implications for you and for me, and particularly for today's child and tomorrow's children. We humans are very recent additions to the evolutionary landscape. This is a plot of population. And you can see that right now in, in 2000, and 11, we are at 7 billion. We're on our way to 10 or 11 billion by the end of this century. And it, if you look down here, though, we didn't get to our first billion until about 1800. So the rate of population growth remains extraordinarily high. Life on Earth is diverse, it's rich, and it's been around for three and a half billion years. Humans, however, have been around for a very short period of time. If you took that three and a half billion years and compressed it into one year, we humans have been around for only the last 15 minutes, and we have had an impact on this planet only in the fi last five seconds or so. But we are now center stage, and we have a lead role in the future life of life on Earth in this evolving, continuing drama. There's no place on this earth that you can go without finding the evidence of the influences of humans. Not to the highest mountain peaks, not to the deepest parts of the world ocean, not to the most remote polar regions, and certainly not to any of the coral reefs that we are celebrating here this evening. Adaptation and evolution have been the ways that life forms have always coped with change. That's been true throughout the beginning of life on this planet. But things are different now. Humans have increased the rate of change so that many species of plants and animals no longer are able to cope with that rate of change. They can't adapt fast enough, and they can't evolve fast enough. And the result is extinction. Extinction has always been a part of evolution, but extinction of species now on Earth is 10 to 100 times greater than it has been at any time in geologic time except during those periods of mass extinctions. And there are many who argue that we are now entering the sixth 
great extinction and that this one is driven by human beings. Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, the famous biologist, the father of the concept of biodiversity, has predicted that the combination of the degradation of environment and rapid climate change could cause the extinction of half of the species we now enjoy by the end of this century. That seems very extreme, but a recent report from the United Nations has predicted that 25% of all mammals, marine and terrestrial, will become extinct before 2050. Just think of that, 25% of all species. Humans clearly are having a major impact on Earth, including the world ocean, and the implications could be profound. But we have it within our capability to change that trajectory. We have the knowledge, we have most of the technology, and I am convinced that art and design can help identify and illuminate the path. The primary issues that we have to deal with are the sources and the amounts of energy that we use and the ways we grow and harvest our food, both on land and in the water. We burn mostly fossil fuels. Across the world, fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas account for more than 85% of all of the energy used on this planet. And the problem with fossil fuels are that they release CO2 to the atmosphere. And it's also the cars that we are all familiar with here in Southern California. These emissions have already had significant impacts. As I've mentioned, the Earth has warmed, and the ocean has warmed, and the ocean is becoming more acidic. At times in the past, there are those who argue that the Earth has been warmer than it is today, and they're right. There are times when CO2 levels in the atmosphere have been higher than today, and they are right. There are times when the ocean has been more acidic than today, and sea level has been higher. But if you look carefully at the geologic record, CO2 levels in the atmosphere have not been this high in over 800,000 years and we human beings have been around for less than 25% of that time. What we need to do is slow down, take a break. We have to somehow give the rest of nature a chance to cope and catch up. And instead of mitigating whatever other drivers of climate change there are, and there are others, we are magnifying them through our energy policies and practices. Our energy policies and practices are taking a toll on the ocean. The biggest impacts are from ocean acidification and ocean warming, and both of these will take a toll on coral reefs. Coral reefs reveal early signs of ocean distress. Can you imagine a beautiful group of works of art, such as we are celebrating this evening, if they were all white, or if they co were covered in a blanket of green slime. That is what's happening to many of our coral reefs today. Coral reefs are home to more than 25% of all known species of fish, and they provide our ocean with the greatest assemblages of biodiversity of any ocean ecosystems. They are beautiful, magical, mysterious ecosystems of great importance, not only to marine life, but to all of us. And the two biggest impacts are ocean warming and ocean acidification. Ocean warming leads to bleaching, and ocean acidification makes it difficult for any animal that uses calcium carbonate to build its shell or its skeleton to, to keep up. Ocean acidification is probably the most insidious impact of climate change there is on the world ocean. And it's probably the least well known and understood by the general public. Over the past 200 years since the Industrial Revolution, atmospheric levels of CO2 have increased by more than 35%. And about half of all the CO2 released since the Industrial Revolution has been transferred from the atmosphere to the ocean and the ocean is 30% more acidic than it was at the time of the Industrial Revolution. And the startling thing is that half of that change in ocean acidity 
has occurred within the last 30 years. It is estimated by scientists that we are making the ocean more acidic at a rate 100 times faster than at any time over the last many millions of years. And it affects not only the animals that have calcareous calcium carbonate or aragonite shells and skeletons, but when you remove those, it affects the entire ecosystem in which they live. So these effects can cascade and if through these systems and affect fish stocks and commercially uh, available fisheries and can challenge a protein supply and food security of hundreds of millions and probably several billion people on this planet. And the CO2 emissions that we are measuring today are much greater than had been predicted as recently as 10 years ago. By mid-century, ocean acidification may render most regions of the ocean chemically inhospitable to coral reefs. By the end of this century, if CO2 in the atmosphere is not stabilized, the ocean could be three times more acidic than at the pre-industrial levels. And recovery to something that resembles the current ocean in terms of the, chem the chemistry would take thousands of years. And we know from the geologic record that whenever we have eliminated coral reefs in the past, it takes hundreds of thousands to millions of years for them to reappear. Can you imagine a world without coral reefs? And it could happen. Your young relatives and mine and children yet to be born may never experience the splendor of a vibrant coral reef. Warming of near surf surface waters increases the likelihood of coral bleaching. Coral bleaching results when the coral animals expel the symbiotic algae that grow with them, they expel them. The algae are what have the color, and they, when they are expelled, the coral becomes white. And if the temperature remains high enough for long enough, a coral reef can die. We know that we have increased the average temperature of the Earth by over one and a half degrees since the Industrial Revolution, and that it continues to increase. The last decade was the warmest decade since we have had measurements. According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, coral reefs uh, have been reduced by 30% in their aerial extent since the 1980s. So in less than 30 years, we've lost 30% of the coral reefs that we have. And that by mid-century, a majority of coral reefs will be threatened by temperatures that are high enough to cause coral bleaching. And the report states that by mid-century, corals could become rare in tropical and tropical areas of the ocean. So it's clear that our carbon-fueled civilization is affecting life everywhere in the world ocean and everywhere on Earth. The irony is that fossil fuels allowed us and our civilization to develop. And there are still billions of people on this planet who do not enjoy the benefits that we do in terms of quality of life and access to energy. And they want it. So the irony is that while we couldn't have developed without these fossil fuels, the, their continued use now threatens our very future. So for me, the number one ocean stewardship job is to reduce our CO2 emissions to the atmosphere. Everything else pales in importance to this. And it must come largely through the reduction of our use of fossil fuels. We have to do it in three different ways. We have to conserve. Each of us has to use less fossil fuel energy. And if you multiply that by millions and hundreds of millions of people across the globe, it will make a difference. We also have to work to increase the efficiency of all of the ways in which we use fossil fuel as societies. And then we have to transition to non-fossil fuel sources of energy. And we're lagging in all of those areas. I'm sure most of you remember T.S. Eliot's Little Gidding and Four Quartets. And in the fourth quartet, 
there's this wonderful passage, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all of our exploring will be to end up, to arrive at where we started and to understand it for the first time. It's ironic when you think about it, we have put 12 men on the moon. We have put another 12 men very close to the moon. We put two people to the deepest part of the ocean and it was 1950, almost 60 years ago. We are not paying enough attention to our own planet. We need to get to know our own Earth and live more sustainably. Art and design, I think, must play major roles. Art has the power to jolt emotions and to allow us to imagine more productive, better futures. When people have examined what's the evolutionary advantage of art, the one thing they seem to agree on is it allows us to anticipate crises and develop strategies to avoid them. And design is more than just how something looks. It is created for an intended purpose or function. Design is a way of thinking, planning, and problem solving that often is the result of collaborative teamwork, not only of designers, but of designers and scientists and engineers. And in the world of design, they say that design is art that works. We at the Aquarium of the Pacific look forward to a continuing collaboration with Art Center College of Design to create a new planet right here on Earth. We have it within our capacity to do it, and it's really our only option. Thank you. <laughs>